Hello and welcome. Happy Sabbath to everyone. My name is Steve Asatani and I would like to welcome everyone to the Honolulu Japanese Seventh-day Adventist Church 11 o'clock worship service. You may notice from my backdrop that I am at the church, but I am pre-recorded. So uh, we are in the middle of a stay-at-home mandate and uh, I hope everyone is well in the middle of it. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're healthy. Hope you're virus free. But um, even though our church is closed during this time, uh, we uh, are coming to you remotely. So uh, welcome everyone. And I have a few announcements to make for you. Um, even though our church is closed and we're only able to worship through, um, through remote, um, we are having a drive-by visitation this afternoon. And if you are interested in visiting um, Carl and Che Yazawa, and also Helen and Grace Kusahara, we will be um, driving by their homes at 1.30 in the afternoon. So if you would like to participate in that, meet in the church parking lot between 1 and 1.20. And then we'll get together and, and we'll caravan to their house. We did it before to uh, Mr. Fanai's house last Sabbath, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, we also visited Florence Zane the week before, and it is a lot of fun. Uh, one other announcement is we will be starting prayer meeting again. Uh, Pastor Brunel will start on September 9, Wednesday evening at 6.30. For about one hour, we'll be starting uh, studying the book of John and um, it should be very good. I'm, I'll be looking forward to that. And if you're interested, please mark that on your calendar. Watch the newsletter so that you can get the Zoom link. It won't be held at church, it'll be through Zoom. Okay, and um, thank you for uh, your faithful tithes and offerings. Uh, you could uh, do your offerings and tithes online or you can uh, stop by the church and pick up an envelope and, and drop your ties off. Uh, either way, we'll, we'll be fine. Okay, so I think we can uh, begin our Sabbath worship program. If you will join me in a word of prayer, uh, please bow your heads. Our Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to uh, come together and to worship you. Lord, even though we are not able to gather under one roof in the sanctuary, uh, as is customary, Lord, we um, are gathered in our respective homes, and Lord, we still have uh, respectfully have taken the time to honor the, the Sabbath hours. And Lord, I still expect that this moment that we can spend together, that Lord is a time reserved so that we can uh, give you our praises and give you our worship, and Lord, that you in turn can bless us with uh, revelations of your never-ending love for us. Uh, Lord, we are living in very uncertain times. Uh, things seem so uncertain, chaotic. It's really just hard to figure out what is going on with, with this pandemic. Lord, it is truly refreshing to be able to open your word and just to escape the problems of our week and, and to remember that your word is sure it is uh, steadfast. Lord, it's proven to always be trustworthy in the past. And Lord, I find no reason to doubt its authenticity for us in the future. And Lord, I just want to thank you for your many blessings, your watching care. And Lord, I ask for your continued uh, leadership and, and blessings and, and care for our church, all of the members. Lord, please uh, speak to each person's heart here this Sabbath day. Be with all the, the studies, be with all the prayers, and uh, Lord, the ministry and songs and, and stories that are told. Lord, may your goodness be revealed to us today. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.
and girls and happy Sabbath. My name is Auntie Amy and today for children's story I wanted to share with you about one of God's amazing creatures. It's called a Jackson chameleon. Have you ever seen one before? Uncle Mike bought two of these Jackson chameleons for us as pets earlier this year. I honestly would have liked a fluffier pet like a puppy but after having these pets for the past few months I've been able to learn some really cool things that they're able to do. First let me introduce them to you. This is Baba, right? We named him. He is the boy Jackson chameleon. And you can tell he's a male because he has these three horns on the top of his head. Instead of, you want to look this way, this is our female one. Her name is Mama. And she doesn't have any horns. There's some special things about these animals that I want to show you. If you can see, their eyes can actually look in two different directions at the same time. And this helps when they're in the wild because they can look in the front, but also in the back or even the side. If anyone thinks trying to sneak up on them, they can look in different directions. See his eyes? Another neat thing about these jacksonians is their tongue. Their tongue can actually stretch more than one and a half times how long their body is. And at the end of their tongue is really sticky saliva that helps them capture their, their bugs that they're trying to eat. Let's see if Mala will show us. I'm going to put some crickets into the cage. And let's see if she'll eat it. crunching the cricket. Another thing you can see is their little feet. They actually have mitten shaped little feet and that helps them to hold on to branches because they usually live in the trees. The Jackson chameleons can also change colors. They have these special cells in their skin called chromatophores and this helps them to change colors depending on their mood or their temperature or on their health. For example, when we first got Lala, she would often get very scared, so she was often a dark green, almost black color. Now, once in a while, she'll get a little bit happier and turn a brighter green, especially when she's eating, she gets happier. And their tails are also very strong. They can actually suspend their whole body just with their tail and lift themselves back up. Last month, she actually gave us a surprise. I was coming to 
changed their water and I noticed that the top of her cage looked like a lot of black and white speckles. I thought a bird had made a lot of poop on their cage. But then I saw that those speckles started moving and she had actually had babies. Jackson Camellias give birth to live babies. An average litter is eight to 30 babies. Luckily, she only had seven. Here's a baby camellia. Riley's trying to get on her finger. Uh -huh. Go on. I'm trying to sleep. Hello, baby. I hope you enjoyed learning about our Jackson chameleons today. When I learned about them, it made me think about, wow, what an amazing God we have who was able to imagine up all the different animals we have in this whole world, from the panda bears to the elephants to the monkeys. They are all so unique and different. And that's just like you boys and girls. God has made each one of you one of a kind and special. So if you ever feel like I wish I was taller or I wish I was faster or my hair was a different color, I hope you remember that God has made each one of you and each one of you is loved and special and one of a kind. Thank you. Riley, would you like to say our prayer? Okay, let's bow our heads. Thank you for this day. And thank you for my family. Thank you for my family. And thank you for all the animals you made. And thank you for everything you have given to us. Amen. Amen. morning and have Sabbath. It's time for our scriptures reading. I want you to open your Bible, the book of Luke, chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 5 and verse 6. Luke 17, 5 and six. And the apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord said, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, Be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. May the Lord's blessing his word. Thank you.
you feel kind of funny giving a, a two-verse scripture reading. <laughs> so, Tony, I hope you didn't feel cheated there. Uh, thank you for that. Disciples come to Jesus and they ask. They, they give this request, increase our faith. And it made me ask the question as, as I read our next story from the ministry of Elisha, how can we measure our faith? What, are, how can I grow my faith? What, what are things I can do to see my faith increased? You ever, have you ever asked that? I don't, I don't maybe, maybe it's not something that's a normal part of, 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 your, uh, of, of life, but, but every once in a while do you stop and say, how, do, how can I measure my faith? How can I see my faith increased? And so as I read this story from Elisha, I saw many examples, and it's, just, it's not a long story. It's from 2 Kings chapter 4, uh, verses 38 through 44. So it's not very many verses at all. And it's a story that I think most of us have probably, probably heard. Maybe we haven't spent a lot of time studying it, but, but I would imagine we, we've at least heard it. And as I, as I read the story, it brought, it brought to mind uh, something that happened during the life of Jesus. And then, as I contemplated that story from the life of Jesus, my mind went back to a story I experienced. And so I'm going to kind of work backwards through all of that. And so I start with a story from when I was running Broken Arrow Ranch, summer camp in Kansas. And there was a boy coming. He had been there the two previous summers. And it had been really, his parents told me, it had been the highlight of his year. Uh, he was a young person who did not have particularly great social skills. He didn't get out a lot. He didn't have a lot of friends, either at school or other places that he went. And summer camp was a place he could go where he really felt included, where he really felt like he was, he was someone like everyone else. And so he dearly loved coming to summer camp. And this was going to be the last year age-wise that he was going to be able to come as a camper. And so he was very excited, and he was, he, was a, he was a wonderful young man. We had no issues. By the way, when you run summer camp, you, you know how you know how you measure whether or not you have good kids at camp? It, it's, it's whether or not they cause trouble. That, that's pretty much it. If, if a young person doesn't cause you trouble, then you consider them, uh, that, that's, a pretty good, that's a pretty good camper right there. So... This young person was, was, was coming for his, his last year of camp, and everything was going fine, and we reached Wednesday night. Now, Wednesday night, what we had done was, we had uh, a special event night, and I forget what the, 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 the crew that planned it had planned something. It was teen camp, so they'd planned something for the young people. We, we had done away. By the way, just so you, we had previously, before I came, uh, special event night was a movie, and we decided we wanted the kids doing stuff instead of watching a movie. So we, our, our, our special activity was, was young people uh, doing these different activities. And so they had this going on. And all of a sudden, this young person just started to kind of close up. He started to have some, some problem. He just started to, you know, uh, started to cry out a little bit. And so we, were, we, we finally got him and got him outside of the lodge, outside of the building, and he was just sitting there, almost like he was, like he was just in his own little world. And, um, and we're like, we weren't quite sure what was going on. We tried calling mom and dad. There was nothing on his registration papers that said there was any trouble whatsoever with, with, this, with this camper. So we were, we were like, wow, what is going on? And we finally couldn't get a hold of mom and finally made the decision, we're going to have to take this young man to the, uh, to the emergency room. You know, because it was, a, it, you know, it, was, it was late at night. There was no place else to go. So we took him to the emergency room. And, of course, they, they, they identified, well, he's having some kind, of a, some kind of a seizure. And it wasn't for another hour or so before parents finally got back in touch with us. And they said, oh, they said, oh, no. Oh, no. They said, during this last year, our son has started to develop uh, started to develop seizures when certain, uh, when so there's certain stimulus, certain stimuli set him off. And we said, well, you know, that's, that's something you might have wanted to have said, 
on, on the paperwork because for the last two, two, two and a half hours, we have been freaked out at him being freaked out. And, and, they, and they said, oh, we're, we're so sorry. We, we know we should have put it on the paperwork, but we were afraid that if we told you about his condition, that you wouldn't let him come to camp. And that's why we didn't tell you. In the book of Matthew, chapter 17, there's a story where Jesus, uh, a man comes to Jesus and he says, my son is possessed with a demon. And he says, my son will have seizures and, and he, will, he will fall into the water and he will fall into the fire. And if there's nobody there to help him, we know that he would probably die either from being burned in the fire or from drowning in the water. He says, I brought him to your disciples, but your disciples were not able to, to help this man. And Jesus says to his disciples, you know, Jesus says to the man, go, your, you know, that, that your, your son will be healed. And then his disciples come to him and said, why couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we cast out this demon? Why couldn't we heal this young man? And Jesus says to them, it is because of your lack of faith. Because of your little faith. And he says, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved into the sea, and it would crumble into the sea. Today I want to tell you a story of faith from the life of Elisha. And I want us at the same time to look at different people in this story and ask ourselves, how can I grow my faith? How can I check my faith? The story is found in 2 Kings chapter 4. In 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha says he came to Gilgal and he's there at the, at the school of the prophets with the sons of the prophets and there was a famine. If you're reading along, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38, and as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, it says, it says, there was a famine in the land. And as the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, he said to his servant, set on the large pot and boil some stew for the sons of the prophets. In the midst of a famine, Elisha says to his servant, maybe it was Gehazi, maybe it was someone else, maybe it was somebody who was, who was just worked at the school or was at the school, one of the students, not sure. But he says to them, hey, hey, why don't you just put on a pot of stew and, and boil it for the sons of the prophets? Make, make them dinner. Well, now I want you to imagine you're this servant. <laughs> yeah, Elisha, I don't know if you noticed, there's a famine we don't have a lot of food. Elisha, I don't know if you noticed, there's not much extra sitting around. I can't just put on a pot and boil it. But I want you to notice, he says, put on a pot for, and boil it for the sons of the prophets. And apparently that is what exactly the man did. He put on a pot, even though he didn't have anything even though there was no food sitting around, even though he really had nothing to cook, he goes ahead and he puts the pot on. And when I read that, I said to myself, faith is found and grown in my everyday living. You see, this man who puts the pot on, he's doing what he's always done. He's not doing anything special. He's doing what he has done probably a hundred or three hundred or five hundred times before. He's doing his everyday life. He's getting ready to cook a meal, and yet just in his one act of putting on that pot, he is showing his faith. He is growing his faith. I think that most of the time, our faith is grown and shown in our everyday living. The things that we do all the time. We sit around waiting for miracles. We sit around waiting for headlines. We sit around waiting for, for uh, all, kinds, all kinds of fancy stuff. And in the meantime, God is saying, I need you to serve me in my everyday life. I need you to show me that you trust in me in everyday things. 
And so this man puts on the pot and says, one of the men went out. And he found, as he was looking for some herbs, could also be translated as he was looking for some vegetables, he came across a, a, a vine that had some gourds on it. It had some, some fruit on it, and he, and he cut off the plant, and it says he took it in, and he cut it up, and he threw it in the stew. By the way, who thinks that's a good plan? He saw a plant he didn't recognize, saw some gourds, cut it up. By the way, I don't know if you guys know, there's a tree right out here. You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about? There's a tree right out here, and it has this thing that grows on it. And this thing looks on oh, a big green ball, and it's like, I'm in Hawaii. Everything's edible, right? <laughs> no, not everything is edible. And I'm like, wow, here's this tree. It's got these big, surely you can eat them, right? No. Are they good for anything? No. See, I believe that plants should either be pretty or edible. Outside of that, I don't know why they exist. Should be pretty or edible. Faith is found and grown in everyday living. We don't like everyday living. We, we want something big to happen. We want something special to happen. We want to see miracles. We want headlines. You know what happens when we go on social media? All we do is we read headlines. It's like, you know, if you read the rest of the story, you know, people wonder why I sometimes have a completely different view than they do of things. I said, it's because I say, I actually listen to the press conference. See, I actually listen to what the people say. I don't just go on social media, find a headline and post it because I think it agrees with me. You see, that's kind of where we've gotten in life. We, we want headlines. We want big stuff to happen. We, we want to see the flashy. See, when a, you want to advertise a product, what do you want? You want a celebrity to tell you that they use that product. But faith is found and grown in everyday living. People just doing what they've done before, but doing it faithfully and doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. This man goes out. He takes these gourds. Cuts them up, throws them in the pot. They cook it up, gets it just right. Dish it up. Mary, you know what's coming. She's sitting there. She's sitting there. I, she has a mask on, but I know she's laughing because we talked about this this week. They cook up, a, they, they, they dish it all out. They spread it all around. The people start to eat. You know this story? They start to eat. What happens? Somebody, somebody takes a bite and they say, oh, hold on a minute. Stop eating. There's death in the pot. That gourd that you put in there, what, what's giving the substance to the stew is poison. What's going to happen? Have we eaten too much? Are we going to die? How is this going to turn out? It says, oh man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat it. And Elisha said, bring me flour. They bring in some flour. And it says, he threw it into the pot. He throws that flour in the pot, and he says, pour some out for the men that they may eat. Okay, I'm going to ask you something. Just, this is, yeah, thank you for laughing already. Because I'm going to be honest, the last few weeks has made me question my ability to tell stories. Let's pretend that you're sitting there around that table. Just for argument's sake. You're one of the sons of the prophets. You're sitting around that table, and you know that, that, that when you feel something chunky, when you take a bite, that it's a poisonous gourd. And this guy throws some flour in the pot and says, all right, it's good. Who's first? Who, who's the first person to say, yep, that's mine? No, no, nobody's going first. 
I'm just trying to picture Elisha looking around the room. All right, guys, eat. Let's go. It's good. I, I put some flour in it. Abraham, Abraham, take a bite. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, I couldn't eat another bite. I'm already full. Uh, uh, Isaac, Isaac, take a, take a bite. Show everybody it's fine. I put flour in it. No, no, you know, I, 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 I can't, I don't, I don't do vegetables. Solomon? No, 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 I'm too smart to eat this. Jacob? No, 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 I saw the flour. I'm gluten intolerant. I just want to know, who was the first guy to say, hmm, this is going to be awesome. I saw him put flour in it. This is good now. Because that person's a person of faith. See, faith is found and grown in my everyday living, and faith is revealed in how I respond to the surprises of life. That was a surprise. They didn't expect that the stew was going to be poison. And they were surprised. It wasn't an everyday thing. It's not every day that you worry about your food being poisoned. This man trusts so much in the power of his God. He did, did by the way, did he trust in the flower? Was it was it was it just be, was it the flower that did something? By the way, I've seen people that try to say, well, you know, if you add flour to certain poisons, oh stop it! It wasn't the flower, it was the power of God. And and these men, and I'm gonna give credit to the guy, I don't know who he was, we don't know his name. I'm gonna give credit to the guy who took the first bite. Because he said. Life has thrown me a surprise, but I'm going to trust that when, I, that when God's man tells me to eat, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to partake because I trust that God will take care of me. Faith is revealed in how I respond to the surprises of life. Elisha says, pour some out for the men that they may eat, and there was no harm in the pot. It wasn't the flower, it was the power of God. Faith is found and grown in my everyday living. Faith is revealed in how I respond to the surprises of life. The Bible then seems to add another story. It says a man... Uh, verse 42, a man from Baal Shalisha bringing, bringing the man of God uh, his first fruits, bringing him bread, 20 loaves of barley, and fresh ears of grain in his sack. So he brings him his first fruits, and they include 20 loaves of barley. It includes some fresh heads of grain. And he gives it to the man of God, and I presume he gave it to the man of God for himself, but instead, Elisha gives him a surprise. Elisha says, huh, no, no. And there's no double standards here. You notice how when times get tough, leaders are always taken care of? You, you notice that? Lead, leaders always make, oh, well, we're more important. Lead, leaders will always take care of themselves when times get tough. Times are tough, and what does Elisha do? This man brings him this food, and Elisha says, well, set it before the sons of the prophets. See, I'm not going to sit around and just take care of myself. I'm going to make sure that everyone is taken care of. This man says, oh, no, 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 whoa, no, no, no. There's not enough, Elisha. There's not, there's not enough for a for hundred people. And Elisha says, set it before them anyway. So the man takes it and he sets it before the men. And, and, and Elisha says, not only are they going to eat, they are going to eat, and there is going to be leftovers. Does that story sound familiar? Like the feeding of the 5,000? And so the man takes it and he sets it before the sons of the prophets, and it says they ate and they had some left over according to the word of the Lord. Faith is a benefit to others when we act. 
allowing God to work. Let me say that one more time. Faith is a benefit to others when we act, allowing God to work. In the Bible, you know, the root word of faith, faith is a verb. Faith was a way that people lived. Faith was something that, that, that was action. It wasn't something that was stuck inside your head. It was something that you did. Faith is a benefit to others when we act, allowing God to work. You see, this man could have said, no, 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 uh uh-uh, Elisha. I'm not going to come here and not have enough for everybody. That's not fair. Instead, Elisha says, no, you put that food out there and you let God work work. You do what you can do. You do what's within your control. You don't have a hundred loaves of barley. You have 20 dedicated to God. I don't have enough to fill all the needs. You You don't need enough to fill all the needs. You need to be faithful to what God has put in your hands. I must be faithful with what God has given me to do. Sometimes we sit around worried about what I have isn't enough. We, we, we say, oh, no, no, I would do that, but, but what I have isn't going to fulfill all the needs. No, God will fulfill all the needs. I must act faithfully. My job is to do my job. My job isn't to fulfill all the needs of mankind. Let's know our role. My role is to act and live the faith that God has given me to live. He'll take care of the miracles. He'll take care of the power. I must live and act in faith. This man from Baal, Shalisha, he doesn't have enough. What he has is inadequate. What he has will not feed the sons of the prophets. But he acts in faith. And that act of faith allowed God to, to work. As I live my life, I must act in faith. Do what is within my control to do. Live the kind of of ethical life that God has asked me to live and allow him, allow him to powerfully work for the results. Sometimes we think that our role is bigger than it is. My role is to act in faith, to live in faith. Faith is found and grown in my everyday living. Faith is revealed in how I respond to the surprises of life. Faith is a benefit to others when we act, allowing God to work. And then there's Elisha, the only one in this story whose name we know. These men all acted in faith. One of them just did his everyday job. He did what he'd always done. He put the pot on. He acted in faith. We don't know his name. (laughs) Another one, I'm going to say, whoever the first one was to take a bite of that stew acted in faith. We don't know his name. Maybe Maybe it was a she. Maybe we don't know her name. And then there's this man We know where he's from. We don't know his name. He brought what he had. He was faithful with what he had. And then there's Elisha. The one who wholly and completely trusted in God. The one who said, even though there's no food, even though there is clearly not enough here, I want you to put on that pot and I want you to start to make stew for these sons of the prophets. Because I know that God will provide. I know that God will not make these these men go without. Elisha who who said, oh no, there's poison in the pot. But I know that God will not let harm come to this group. Elisha who looked at what this man brought and said, no, it's not enough. You know what? Said it before him anyway. Because God will provide. You see, Elisha, Elisha lived a life of mature faith. 
And faith finds its maturity in my life when I learn to trust God in everything. You see, there's a, there's a very, we, we can trust God with the everyday. We can learn God to trust in the times of surprise. We can learn to trust that God will provide even though what we have is not enough. And faith finds its maturity in my life when I learn to trust God in everything. Elisha is the one who trusts that God will provide protect, and overflow for his people. You see, Elisha knew that God would provide. That's why he said to put on the pot. Elisha knew that God would protect. That's why he took the flour and tossed it in and said, go ahead and eat. And Elisha knew that God would provide abundance. He knew that God would overflow. And that's why he said, set that small amount of food in front of these people and it will be more than we could ever hope for. Faith finds its maturity in my life when I learn to trust God in everything. God will provide. God will protect. God will overflow and cause abundance. It was about 2 o'clock in the morning when this young man's parents came to the hospital to pick him up and take him home. He had mostly recovered from the seizure of, a few, of uh, several hours before. They came in and they, they, they kind of slinked into the room a little bit ashamed that they had not told us what was going on. Ashamed that their son had suffered a, a seizure and, and, that, and that we had to see it and deal with it. Ashamed of a lot of different things as they came in, we said to them, let's gather around and let's have prayer. And let's pray that this is the last seizure your son will ever have. They thought they were going to be chewed out. (laughs) They thought that we were going to point the uh, finger of indignation at them. They thought that they were going to be judged for not having been faithful with 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 what was going on with their son. But instead we said, no, no, gather around. We're going to have prayer. We gathered around that boy and we prayed that God would take away this affliction that had so suddenly arisen over the last year. Well, it wasn't the last seizure that that boy had. It was the second to last seizure. He had one more and to this day has not had another. Faithfulness demanded that we pray for that young man. Faithfulness demanded that we showed caring for that family. Yes, they should have done stuff differently, but that was no longer within our control. What was within our control was to show that family a caring, loving attitude that Christians will have. What was needed for that family was for somebody to put their arms around them and to say, we love you and we love your son. And we're going to pray for him. And we're going to trust that God will do what is best. How do we find faith? We find it in everyday things. When we live our everyday life in faithfulness to God, we are measuring up in faith. When we Take a moment to say, how would God have me respond in the face of the surprises of life? We are living a life of faithfulness to God. When we take what is within our control and act on it and allow God to come and work in his power, we are living a life of faith. We will find faith maturing in our life when we have learned to trust God in all occasions and all moments of our life, that will take perhaps the work of a lifetime. But isn't that something we want? Isn't that something we want to try to do each and every day? Is show, our, is show a little bit more that our faith has grown. To show a little bit more that we are rooted 
our lives rooted in the faith of Jesus Christ. It's my hope and my prayer that we will realize that there's moments every day to live and to grow our faith until that day, ultimately, when our faith will be rewarded and we will be joined with Jesus Christ. Until then, let's live watchfully for him. Would you please bow your head? Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you for this story of the poisonous gourds. Thank you for the example of the man who faithfully did what he had always done before and put that pot on to cook. Thank you for that man who courageously stood up and took the first bite of that stew that had so recently been death. Thank you for the faithfulness of that man who, though he did not have enough, dedicated it to you and offered it up to you. And thank you for the example of Elisha, who in all instances knew that you would provide, that you would protect, and that you would give abundance. Lord, may we look each and every day and each and every circumstance we face for the opportunity to live in faith for you. For we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and asking for the strength of the Holy Spirit. Amen.